families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Families Divided TV. If you have yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button now. We would greatly appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to get the notifications of when we post new videos, which is quite a bit, um, you can click on the bell. We want to help as many people and as, as much as we possibly can. So thanks much for doing this. And tonight's episode, Dr. Lyndon Nielsen is going to summarize the 60 studies available as of 2018 that compares the outcome for children who live 35 to 50% of the time with each parent after their separation. This is shared physical custody with children who live primarily or solely with one parent. In the vast majority of studies, the children in the shared parenting families had better outcomes across a wide range of measures, physical, health, depression, anxiety, aggression, and the quality of their relationships with peers and parents. In several studies, the outcomes were equal. In no studies were all outcomes worse for the shared parenting children. These findings help held even after family income and the level of conflict between the parents were factored into the statistical equations. I'm also interested to know what the numbers are now in 2023. So we're going to see this in just a minute. We're also going to hear tonight from attorney Chris Smith, who is going to be one of our presenters at our upcoming fall conference. It's called Alienation, the Truth Regarding the Trauma and the Abuse. This is, I know you get tired of me saying it, but this by far is the best and most intense and effective and exciting conference we will have ever had. Um, this subject is such a hot and triggered button. And these presentations that these 11 presenters are presenting are really, really strong. So you don't want to miss this, both professionals and uh, those of you who are alienated family members. If you're an alienated family member, Invite your professionals, share the, the video that we have on our YouTube channel. This is very important. We are registering now. It is a virtual international conference. If you're not able to make uh, the two and a half days, uh, if you have to miss some segments or whatever, you're able to view this later at your convenience. So that's not a problem. Just go ahead and register now. We are going to be going from Friday night till Sunday night, straight through. Uh, we're going to have during the middle of the night uh, from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. the uh, breakout rooms where you can go and share your stories with other people. This went really well last year and uh, everyone wants us to bring it back. So we have and I, and I hope you'll join us with this. We're having some exciting games, some fun times. Uh, we're going to have a network marketing time. Many things are going on and we're working really hard to make this the best it's ever been. Really, really, really uh, can't wait for it to happen. We're all excited. So go ahead and register and we look forward to hearing from you there. And we're going to hear from Chris Smith telling us again about what he's going to be presenting on. So we're going to be back in just a moment with Dr. Linda Nielsen, who we're honored to have, and Chris Smith right after these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. 
and we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. Sadly, too many know the pain and trauma associated with parental and grandparent alienation. Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present an important international virtual conference on October the 13th through the 15th, 2023. The conference entitled Alienation, The Truth Regarding the Trauma and Abuse, will feature world-renowned experts in the field of alienation. You'll join the conference event coordinator, Elaine Cobb, and moderator, Megan Hunter, as they introduce you to keynote speaker, Dr. Edward Krupp. Plus, you'll hear important presentations from Dr. Joshua Coleman, Lisa Rothfuss, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Chris Smith, Bill Eddy, Dr. Noel Hunter, Dr. Sue Kornblum, Dr. William Burnett, Megan Hunter, and Jordan Treger. Join the many attendees already securing their spot for the conference entitled Alienation, the Truth Regarding the Trauma and Abuse. For information, visit familyaccess.info for all the details. This special conference is being hosted by Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, Steel Partners Foundation, and PASCA. Parental alienation is child abuse. I'm Dr. Linda Nielsen from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I've been invited today to present you with an overview of the 60 studies that compared children's outcome in joint physical custody versus sole physical custody families. These studies were conducted between 1986 and 2017. At the end of this slideshow, I will list several articles for you that give you details of these 60 studies. The definition of joint physical custody in these 60 studies was children who lived with each parent from 35% to 50% time. Most of the studies did include children who were living half time with each of their parents. The quality of the studies is very clear from the fact that 54 out of the 60 studies were peer reviewed and published in academic journals. Three of the studies were published by the Australian Institute of Family Studies research team. And three of the studies were presented in report at the University of South Wales Research Center by their research team. All studies have limitations, and we want to be very clear from the outset that we recognize these 60 studies are correlational. Not all of them are equal quality. The data came mostly from the mothers, and the effect sizes were small to moderate. These limitations are the same limitations that we have for almost all social science studies. Almost all of our studies on parent conflict, co-parenting, and family income have these same limitations. This does not prevent us from applying the data from these studies as we do in most social science. I'll give you a moment to look at this screen. These are the five different measures that were used in the studies to measure children's well-being. The first category that was measured in many of the studies was the quality of children's relationships with their family. This included their quality of their relationships with their parents, their grandparents, and their step-parents. Another category of well-being was the children's emotional problems. Did these children suffer from depression, anxiety, 
low self-esteem, or were they terribly dissatisfied with their lives? A third category of well-being are behavioral problems. These include delinquency, hyperactivity, drug, alcohol, and smoking as teenagers. The fourth category is physical health. Was the general health of children different in these two types of families? Particularly, the studies look at stress-related illnesses, insomnia, headaches, stomach aches, signs of stress. And the fifth category that the studies often looked at was cognitive development. How were these children doing in school? And how were they doing on measures of achievement, achievement tests? In the 60 studies, children had better outcomes in the shared parenting families in 34 of the 60 studies. The children were better on every measure of well being that was included in the study. In 14 of the 60 studies, the shared children were better on most measures and equal on the other measures. In six of the 60 studies, the shared children were better on most measures and worse on one measure. And in six of the 60 studies, there were no differences on any of the measures between the two groups of students and children. Overall, here's the picture. In the 60 studies, six studies found no differences between the two groups of children. 54 of the 60 studies found that the shared children, the joint physical custody children had better outcomes on all or most of the measures of well-being. One of the criticisms that's raised against this, these studies is that the effect sizes were small. Effect sizes means how strong were the differences between the two groups. Yes, it is true that the effect sizes were small. This is also true of many of the studies on parent conflict and family income. Small effect sizes in social science does not mean that we do not take these findings very seriously because even small effect sizes impact thousands of children. Keep in mind too that even though the small effect sizes are true, in the 60 studies, the differences between the two groups of children were still statistically significant. When people are trying to discredit the data from the 60 studies, they will also often try to claim that it was family income or low conflict between the parents that really was making the difference, that the shared parenting, the joint physical custody, didn't have anything to do with the kids' better outcomes. The reasons they are trying to conjure up here is to say shared parenting couples, shared parenting parents, oh, they're so much richer. They have so much more money than parents who don't share. The other excuse that's offered or myth that is offered is that shared parenting couples they don't have conflict. They get along so well. They're such good buddies. And the third myth is that couples who have shared parenting happily agreed to this from the outset. They both wanted this. Nobody had to be talked into it. But are those beliefs true? Let's look first at the question of money. Forget about shared parenting. Forget about sole physical custody. For the past three decades, researchers have been asking the question, do richer parents 
have better adjusted children. In other words, is money the most important factor or one of the most important factors in children's outcomes? The answer is no. Except for children who are growing up in poverty, decades of research have found family income is not closely linked to children's behavioral or emotional problems. Family income is not closely in linked to drug and alcohol use for teenagers. And family income is not closely linked to the quality of parent-child relationship. In other words, family income, with the exception of poverty, is not what accounts for children's well-being or their outcomes. So now we turn to those studies that looked at family income. Of the 60 studies, 27 of them gathered information about the parents' incomes and they compared that. When the parents' incomes were taken into account, the shared children still had better outcomes on every measure of well being. In seven of those 27 studies, they had better outcomes. In one of those 27 studies, they had equal outcomes. And in two of the 27 studies, they were equal on most and worse on one. In other words, family income is not what accounted for the better outcomes for the shared children. Then I wanted to look at the question of, do the shared parenting couples really have less conflict than parents who are not sharing the physical custody of the children? In a review of the literature, I found 20 studies that had compared the conflict and the quality of co-parenting between the sharing and the non-sharing parents. In 15 of those 20 studies, there were no differences in the level of conflict between the parents. In only two of the studies, was there less conflict between the sharing parents? In two of the studies, the mixed results were too confusing to draw any conclusion. And in one study, the shared parenting couples had more conflict than the non-sharing couples. So again, if we look at these 20 studies, it is a myth that the shared parenting couples get along so much better than other separated couples. Do shared parenting couples have less conflict? No. Going back to the 60 studies, 28 of the 60 studies did account for conflict and co-parenting before they compared the outcomes for the two groups of children. In those studies, 12 of these studies still found that the shared children had better outcomes on all measures. Nine studies, they had better outcomes on most measures. Three studies, the children were equal in both groups. And four studies, the results were mixed. Let's look at this slide carefully again. Are joint physical custody children better off even after we account for the amount of conflict between their parents? The answer is yes. I want to give you a minute to look at this slide carefully. This is a summary of the studies that have looked at the impact 
of sharing even after we account for the income of the parent and the conflict between the parents. The picture here is clear that conflict and income did not account for the better outcomes of shared children. The other question that is still very controversial is the question of whether or not shared parenting is helpful or is harmful to children under the age of four. Let us be very clear. There are only four studies that have ever addressed that question, only four. Two of the baby studies were American studies. Let's look at each of those two American studies. Children from zero to five years old, there were only 174 children who were in shared parenting. Be very careful if you hear people talk about this study. This study was conducted with inner city, racial minority families living below the poverty line. These parents had very high rates of mental health problems, abuse and addiction problems, and 80% of these parents had never been married, many of whom had never even lived together. This means you cannot generalize the results of this study to the typical family. Even so, even in this very poor group of families, group of poor families, the outcomes were still equal in the shared and the non-shared children. The only exception was that the babies who overnighted frequently, who had shared parenting, had more insecure attachment scores to their mothers. The catch here was 65% of those babies were living with their father. Yes, they had more insecure attachment scores to their mothers because they were living primarily with their fathers. The positive outcome in this study was for the four and five-year-olds, the ones who were in shared parenting were more emotionally and socially well-adjusted. The second study, American study, was with college students, 72 college students who had been in shared parenting families since they were three or four years old. And what we found here, what Fabricius found here, is that those college students who had been in shared parenting ever since they were two to four years old, had better relationships with their parents. But here's the key. Not only did they have better relationships with those parents, even when their parents had disagreed about sharing, even when their parents were in high conflict, and regardless of the parents' educational level, which was a substitute proxy for income, despite this, they still had better outcomes. Again, conflict, disagreement is not what made the difference for these 72 college students. The only other two baby studies is the, a study in Sweden by Bergstrom and her colleagues and a study in Australia by McIntosh and her colleagues. In the Swedish study with three to five-year-olds, there were 136 shared parenting children. It was a nationally representative sample. And the outcome was these three to five-year-olds in shared parenting families had fewer emotional and behavioral problems, even after considering parents' education, which again, is a proxy for income. The other study which 
I'm sure many of you have heard about because it was worldwide news for many, many years, was an Australian study with children zero to five years old by McIntosh and her colleagues. In this study, there were only 11 to 59 children in shared parenting families. Very, very small sample. It was a nationally representative sample. However, 80% of these parents had never been married. Very few had attended or graduated from college. And this one study has been widely refuted by leading scholars as having been misinterpreted and seriously flawed. Despite the problems in this study, the shared and sole parenting children were equal on five of the six measures of well being at all ages. The only difference was that the shared parenting infants tried more often to get their mother's attention. The researchers claimed that this was a sign of insecurity. The other finding that was different for the two groups of children was that the shared parenting toddlers were less persistent at tasks. Taken together then, these four baby studies give us no cause for alarm. The conclusions from these 60 studies is that Joint physical custody parents do not have less conflict or better co-parenting relationships. The shared custody children, the shared parenting children generally fare better regardless of family income, even when conflict is high, and even when we do not have cooperative co-parenting. The studies here that you can consult for details about the 60 studies and details, particularly about the Australian studies and details on the studies about conflict and income can all be accessed either by emailing me. If you don't have access to them online, I'd be happy to send you these articles by email. In closing, I would like to say the 60 studies are very clear. The 60 studies are very consistent. Shared parenting is beneficial for children. What we hope is that these data will continue to be disseminated to policymakers, to parents, to practitioners who work with children. And through your good effort, you can continue to try to spread the news about these data and hopefully to refute many of the woozles and myths and misconceptions that people still have about these 60 studies that span over 25 years of research. I appreciate the invitation to present this research to you. And I'm sure that this conference will bring about a great positive impact for children whose parents are no longer living together and who need the benefit of your good work and the good work of all these very fine researchers. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Smith. I am a family law attorney in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And on October 13th through the 15th, I'll be participating and speaking uh, at the conference, Alienation, the Truth Regarding the Trauma and the Abuse. I hope you'll join me. Um, I'm going to be talking about parental, al parental alienation uh, and the fact that there's plenty of blame to go around as it relates to the issue. Um, as we all know, parental alienation is a known tactic used by family law litigants uh, to gain leverage in custody cases. 
However, a parent can only alienate as much as the family law system will let them. Uh, I, judges, attorneys, psychologists, therapists, uh, CPS workers, you know, everyone in this entire system plays a role in every case and every alienation case, especially. Uh, so I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about um, how the system allows for the unjustifiable division uh, in distance of children from the target parent. Uh, what can we do as an industry uh, to better safeguard against it? I'm very excited about this topic because I think it's one that doesn't get talked about enough. It's one that uh, sometimes gets lost in the noise. Uh, there's a lot of conversations around the fact that uh, targeted parents are you know, the, the victims. There's a lot of noise regarding the alienating parent. Uh, there's a lot of noise regarding the the argument as to whether parental alienation is real or not, and whether it's yeah, pseudoscience or not. Um, I really want to talk about how the system uh, that we are working in and uh, is contributing to the alienation of children from their parents and the systemic issues within our family law court system uh, that we need to be addressing. I want to talk about what those are. I want to talk about how we can counteract those issues and maybe some tips and uh, ways to try to avoid the pitfalls that can sometimes result in uh, alienation that doesn't have to occur. Um, for example, if you are a parent who is uh, not getting an opportunity to see your child, are you making sure that you're doing everything you can to try to get back in front of a judge as soon as you can? Or are you allowing time to go by that you don't need to? Um, there are some specific things I think we can all do as attorneys. We can uh, do them as uh, guardians, guardian ad litems. We can uh, do it as uh, mental health professionals to help try to avoid unnecessary uh, distance between parents and children during the process. Uh, I want to talk about how we can counteract those things as well as any potential policy changes we might want to be talking about to safeguard against alienation by the court itself. I'm really excited about this. I hope you'll join me. I hope you'll uh, join us uh, during this conference again, October 13th through the 15th. Um, alienation, the truth regarding the trauma and the abuse. Join me as we talk about where we can point a little bit of blame beyond the alienating parent in this systemic issue. Hope you'll join me. Next week on Families Divided TV, Job Sander discusses parental alienation as an outcome of paternal and parental discrimination.